Okay, good afternoon everyone. It's a great pleasure to introduce Manos Kiopakis to the Department of Physics and Astronomy Colloquium. So Manos did his bachelor's degree in physics in, at the University of Crete in Greece. And afterwards he went to the US in, to the University of California in Berkeley where he got his PhD degree in the group of Stephen Louis doing uh, computational work using um, all kinds of, of, of methods, mainly looking at excited state properties of materials. Then afterwards, he, he did a post postdoc, he had a postdoc position at the University of California, Santa Barbara in the group of Chris Pandewal, a group where I also overlap briefly with Manos. So we, we know each other for quite some time. And then afterwards, he joined the faculty at the University of, of Michigan where he's still currently a professor. So he also got lots of awards like the NSF Career Award, got award for his teaching, his general awards. And he has been keeping, keeping up all the interesting research he's been doing. And he will be talking about some of that, especially related to ultra wide band gap materials today at this colloquium. So Manos, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Hartwing. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And, and thank you very much for the welcoming opportunity to present to you here today. I have to apologize. I'm really sorry I, I wasn't able to be there in person to, 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 to get to meet all of you in person and, and, and visit your university. So I'm really sorry I wasn't able to. But thank you for joining the, for the talk today. I would like to discuss about the group, the work from my group on how to use theory to characterize and predict new ultra wide band gap semiconductors. And I'm, I'm going to define you know, what that means in this talk. So um, as Professor Perlars mentioned, um, I'm in material science and engineering, by, but my background is in physics. So my education and training is in physics. And I work at this interface between physics, material science, and electrical engineering, and, and in chemistry, as, if you wish. So I will start by uh, defining what semiconductors are and what are their applications. And the first application of semiconductors was computing, right? We use semiconductors to make uh, transistors, diodes, and then use them to create logical circuits. And here you see an example of the first programmable electronic computer, which was called ENIAC, developed during the war, you know, to simulate uh, reactions in nuclear materials. And also operational for 10 years, it was based on vacuum tubes. Uh, if you see these huge panels here on the back side, they're full of, of, of vacuum tubes. And um, the, you know, the old version of a transistor made of glass uh, three terminal devices. Um, its power was 500 floating point operations per second. That's divisions, multiplications or, or something like that, which was still um, orders of magnitude faster than what humans could do at the time. So it really accelerated the war effort in the development of, of, um, of uh, nuclear materials. 500 petaflops sounds like a lot compared to a human, but as we uh, know today's computers are much faster than that. Even a smartphone that we carry around in our pockets today has a computing power on the order of 100 gigaflops, right? So a billion times faster. And uh, you don't have to fill a room with that. Uh, and if you really want to go big, if you look at some of the state-of-the-art machines that we have today, such as the new Perlmutter computer at the DOE NERSC facility in the Berkeley National Berkeley National Laboratory, we are now uh, have exceeded the petaflop scale and we're approaching the exascale. So several orders of magnitude uh, higher than those early computers. So, so th these advances in computing over, over the past few decades have been exponential. And it completely changed the way we live our lives. But that, that's not the only application of semiconductors, though. And today you will find semiconductors in many other aspects of our daily lives. Um, for example, silicon is also used uh, to make solar cells to absorb the energy of the sun and convert it to electricity with an efficiency that today is approaching 20%. So uh, great for renewable and sustainable energy without CO2 emissions. Semiconductors can also be used to emit light efficiently. Materials such as gallium nitride or gallium arsenide are used to emit any wavelength you want from the red to the blue. And we have, today we have all wavelengths of the visible spectrum, in, including white light. And their efficiency is quite amazing. Some of the blue LEDs are the most efficient light sources we have today. The efficiency of a blue LED approaches 80%. 80% is the efficiency 
from electrons in the socket in the wall to blue photons coming out of your LED. So almost 100%. So at this point, what happens is that the cost of photons, the dollar amount you have to pay for photons, is about the dollar amount you pay for electrons, for electricity. And with that, we can talk, start talking about applications that include, that use kilowatt hours of photons, such as indoor agriculture that you see here. So, um, and today we're using blue and red LEDs that are being absorbed by the uh, green cells in the plants. Uh, we can grow uh, crops indoors in all kinds of climates, uh, including Michigan in the middle of the winter. So uh, that's how we get amazing strawberries and tomatoes here in Michigan when, when it's hard to transport them from, uh, from, uh, from afar. And, and I mentioned this application, it really resonates with me because there are many ways to convert energy between different forms, say from, you can convert electricity to light or heat or uh, magnetic energy and anything you can imagine. But this is the only way I can think of on how to convert electricity to food, uh, which, you know, is it's what, what we need to survive ourselves. So making this process efficient is, a, is, is an amazing prospect in uh, particular in parts of the world where food is not easily accessible uh, because of the season or because of the, of the climate. And last but not least, I also want to emphasize the applications of converting heat to electricity that also happens to semiconductors. And as an example, I show the Perseverance rover on the Mars surface, which is powered not by solar cells or batteries, but by the, this device. So this device in its core, it has a piece of nuclear material that as it decays, it produces heat. We don't want to use the particles, but the heat being produced. And, and, and what happens is that this heat source is in contact with thermoelectric semiconductors that take this, uh, temperature, that this temperature difference and they use it to conduct electrons from the hot side to the cold side. And that harvests some waste heat. And, and by converting this uh, heat to electricity, uh, you can do these missions on Mars. It's another very efficient source, but when you're on Mars or the moon, it's, it's really precious. And in contrast to the previous rovers, it's not limited when it's too dusty or when it's night. So it can work day and night and no matter what the weather conditions. So these are some applications of semiconductors. Um, of course, all of this started in the field of physics, right? There's a major success in the field of physics, uh, the, the development of semiconductor materials and the first devices. It was recognized by the Nobel Prize to Shockley, Bardeen, and Bratain for making the first transistor that you see here. The first a solid state three terminal device that acts as a switch and controls the flow of electricity. So a huge success of physics, but even a few years before, it didn't seem so obvious. And I'm quoting here a famous quote from Pauli that one should not work on semiconductors because they are a filthy mess. Who knows whether semiconductors exist at all, <laughs> right? So which is a, uh, even just a few years ahead of time. And I want to say something, Pauli was right. Semiconductors don't exist because if you look at the news, you will find out that today we have a semiconductor chip shortage because we can't produce them fast enough during the pandemic for all the industries they needed, whether it's refrigerators, cars, appliances, cell phones. Yeah, um, if you look at the industry, every industry has been hit by the pandemic except the semiconductor industry. So, so yeah, semiconductors don't exist today. All right, so besides this, this, uh, this uh, light point, I, um, I want to emphasize that in these semiconductors now are, are really changing our lives in every industry. So looking back now to the science, I want to ask the question, what is a semiconductor, right? Okay, we know silicon is a semiconductor, but what else is a semiconductor? How do we define it? So in solid state theory, we, we know that the electrons in materials are organized in bands that are separated by gaps. And here's a picture from an introductory materials textbook. So the energy levels that we know from atoms, the 1s, the 2p state, etc., when you go to a solid material, broaden and become energy bands, regions that have uh, electron states which are fully occupied, regions of energy where we have states but are empty, and regions where we don't have any states at all because of the resonant interaction of electron waves with a crystal. So depending on the situation, some of these materials may be semiconductors or insulators, depending on what. The key property seems to be the band gap according to textbooks. So if you look at a metal or a semi-metal, in a metal, the field states 
have no energy separation with the empty states. We have what so-called a Fermi energy that separates the fully occupied from the fully empty states, and there is no gap. This material will conduct because even if you apply a very small electric field, those electrons can get accelerated and they will conduct electricity. Um, same with the semi-metal. Again, here the bands are fully occupied, but because they overlap in energy, you still have a Fermi level. In contrast, the insulators are characterized by a band gap, meaning that the highest occupied state and the lowest empty state are separated in energy by an amount on the order of EVs or more. Okay, in this situation, if you apply a field, you will not get conduction, right? You, you know, thermal energy is not enough to excite electrons across this band gap and conduct, and so that would be an insulator. Think, think of like silica here, think of glass or sand. In contrast, semiconductors also have a gap, but the gap tends to be narrower. Uh, so, for example, the band gap of silica is around 8 or 9 EV. The band gap of silicon, uh, silica means silicon dioxide, the insulator in our circuit, but silicon itself has a band gap around 1 EV. And because the, the gap is narrower, it's easier to, to conduct. But I want to emphasize here that this is not really a, a very clear picture, right? Uh, how do you distinguish between semiconductors and insulators, right? Semiconductors are not just bad conductors, right? They're not just bad conductors of electricity. So the defining property of the semiconductor is not the band gap, as you would see in these international textbooks. The defining property is doping. Okay. The key property of the semiconductor is that can be doped. They can be doped p-type, they can be doped n-type, and you can make things like p-n junctions or p-n-p transistors, which are actually smart electronic circuits, right? A diode conducts only one way. A metal cannot do that. And so the, the doping is controllable uh, by doping or by applying electric fields, and the conduction of electricity is efficient. These two properties, doping and ease of conduction, are easier to achieve if your material gap is narrower. And, 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 and that, that's where the, the classification comes from based on the band gap. So again, silicon, the, the, the workhorse of today's um, in, industry in, in, in informatics, in um, consumer electronics and solar cells with a bank of 1.1 EV is the, the prototypical semiconductor. And, and truly, it is one of the most successful materials in the history of technology, along perhaps with steel and concrete. Now, however, there are two things silicon does not do well. Silicon does not emit light, and silicon does not do well when you go to high power. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about the power aspect today. So in recent years, there's more and more effort towards developing semiconductors with band gaps wider than those of silicon. Okay. And I'll mention here silicon carbide in the 4H polytype and gallium nitride with band gaps of around three electron volts. These two are commercial. Um, and especially when you go to, want to go to high power. And one of them, when I say high power is silicon is great when you work at five volts, but if you want to work at 500 volts, Silicon becomes problematic. Um, silicon can't tolerate 500 volts. You would fry a typical microchip. So you need to make your silicon chips thicker and bigger. And when you make them bigger, they act like big resistors, right? Nevertheless, they're still cheaper than these fancy materials. So for example, if you buy an electric car, there's lots of chips around to control the flow of electricity from the batteries to the motors, but they're still based on silicon. And only Tesla uses silicon carbide because it adds about $100 to the cost of the car to replace the silicon electronics with silicon carbide. And in recent years, you also see applications of gallium nitride in power electronics, uh, which an semiconductor is also used to make those blue LEDs I was telling you about earlier. And that's just becoming, to, becoming commercial. Um, so these are uh, existing technologies, but the dream is to go to even wider band gaps. And here I'll give you some examples. Uh, for example, diamond. Uh, diamond in the world of semiconductors is a semiconductor with a band gap of 5.5 EV. Uh, I don't know if you've been to Washington DC to see the Hope diamond. It has a very famous blue color to it. So this diamond is blue because it is doped by boron. It's a P-type semiconductor, so it semiconducts. 
Also other materials are the boronitride, the aluminum nitride from the nitride family. And recently the gallium oxide, I'll tell you more about gallium oxide uh, with the bang gaps of, you see them, they have gaps wider than the 3.5 EV of, of, of gallium nitride. As you see, the progress has been going towards wider and wider bang gaps. What can you do with these materials? First of all, why do you want the bang gap to be wide? The reason is the wider the bang gap of the semiconductor, the high, the stronger the electric field it can, it can tolerate. And this relationship is, is not just linear, it's super linear. It's either the square or the cube power that you see here from this empirical law. So you go by going through, from silicon to gallium nitride, you have an order of magnitude at least boost in the uh, breakdown field, meaning you have know, much higher voltages. And you can do things like this. This is like a power adapter, like a computer adapter made with gallium nitride except instead of being a big brick that we're using our computers, it is shrunk down to one and a half inch. So being able to do power electronics with semiconductors will have very important um, implications in, for example, the defense industry, because we can use them for radar, for example, and, and jamming and all kinds of applications. We can use them for energy efficient electronics in the power grid. Uh, for example, we can use them uh, to make a smart electricity grid to, co to conduct electricity from the power plants to our homes and vice versa when we have renewable sources. Um, another thing you can do with them though is you can also use them to emit deep ultraviolet light. And when I say deep ultraviolet, I mean a wavelength of around 260 nanometers, which corresponds to an energy of 4.8 EV. You see, you must have 4.8 EV in order to emit this kind of photons, right? And the reason why we want this wavelength is because what I'm showing here is I'm showing you the absorption spectrum of DNA. And DNA base pairs absorb uh, resonantly at this wavelength. And what happens is when you have any, uh, the, the living cells are usually transparent except the DNA. So UV light can penetrate the cells, uh, hit the DNA and damage it. So this, this radiation of two six nanometers can kill any living organism. So they use them in Shanghai to sterilize and sanitize the buses amid the coronavirus pandemic. You can use them to sanitize and sterilize water. And you can also power them with the, uh, even small solar cells. So in parts of the world where there's no access to clean water, you can use this technology based on LEDs to, to sterilize drinkable water and remove bacteria like cholera or other kinds of viruses. And so uh, even the water we, we drink uh, in the facilities, the, the first thing that happens when we collect from a river or a lake or underground is to, to kill anything that lives in it and we use UV lights for it. Except as you see here in Shanghai, the Shanghai picture as well, we rely on fluorescent light tubes. We don't use LEDs for that purpose because UV LEDs are not very efficient based on semiconductors. So these are the big applications. You see there are lots of uh, life-changing uh, devices we can, we can create with these materials, and therefore the push to develop semiconductors with even wider and wider band gaps. And I want to mention also about beta gallium oxide for power electronics. So the oxide of gallium is one of the most actively researched semiconductors today. And uh, the reason is that its band gap of nearly five electron volts is in the ultra wide range. It has a record breakdown field and uh, you can, it, it is dopable and tight and also comes in this large diameter wafer. So it's easy to process, easy to make devices and many records have been realized with this material. And if you look at the literature these days, every week you will see numerous new articles on, 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 on better, better phase of gallium oxide including the work by Professor uh, Harpin Perlars, who has discovered uh, many interesting effects with, with this material. Um, how, however, there are many reasons why gallium oxide will not satisfy everything that we're looking for in, in the high power electronics field. Um, for one thing, if we look at the mobility of electrons in this material, it is sizable at room temperature, it has a value of around 100, uh, which is uh, it's, it's a good number, but it's still about six times lower than that of uh, gallium nitride. In, in many semiconductors, we see mobility is more than a thousand. So that means that the efficiency at which heat fl uh, electricity flows through the material uh, is, is not the same. It's six times more resistive, you produce six times more heat. 
the problem with the heat is that not only you produce more heat, but it becomes harder to extract. The reason is the thermal conductivity of this material, it's anisotropic because it's an isotropic crystal structure, but the values are in the range of 10 to 30. Again, these are at least one order of magnitude lower than competing technologies such as silicon carbide or, or silicon. So you produce more heat, it's hard to extract this heat, so these devices heat a lot and, and that degrades the performance a lot. And another major limitation though is that even though the material can be doped n-type, there are no reports of p-type doping. And we understand the reasons. The reason is that if you look at the bands of these materials, the, the curvature of these bands tells you how easy it is for electrons and holes to move in this material. So if you look at electrons, the bands are quite parabolic. They're, the, the, the black solid lines are the more accurate methods. And so these parabolas are good, it means that this material, the electrons have a light effective mass. But if you look at the valence band, the occupied states, you see that they're flat. And that's a bad sign because it means that holes are have a hard time transporting in this material, and they may even get uh, self-trapped and form these polarons that you see here. <laughs> so a hole will localize the lattice and will trap itself within its own distortion. As a result, there's no p-type conductor, there's no p-type dopants, and as a result, you cannot make CMOS devices. CMOS is the technology you want to use where you have both an NPN transistor and, a, and both a p-type and an n-type uh, channel in order to, to, to make the all kind of the devices that we want. And the reasons behind all these factors is the low symmetry of the crystal structure. The fact that the material has this crystalline anisotropy um, because of the, the, of the nature of the bonding. And there's lots of work going on in this area to understand the limitations and find ways to overcome them. And um, I will point you to, to the work by Professor Perlars and his group. Uh, about uh, the work on these materials and, and alloys. I had a great discussion uh, with a student from Professor uh, Pallaris's group today, uh, and it was a, a very, very stimulating work uh, in this area. Um, all right, so now uh, let me highlight some of the challenges that we face. So why do we not have more ultra-bang up semiconductors? How, what are the problems we're facing? So one problem that I will spend some time on is it is hard to dope them. The efficiency of doping is, is poor. The reason is as the gap becomes wider and wider, it is harder to ionize the dopants, those additional impurities will put the material to enable conduction, but also we form compensating defects that trap those charges and prevent the conduction. Also problems like the lower mobility, the forming the formation of polarons, as well as the growth challenges, because many of these materials need to be grown at relatively high temperatures. So lots of challenges that need to be overcome in this process. And, and these are experimental challenges, which I'm not the expert to talk about, but I can talk more about those fundamental limitations, even if you were to have the pristine ideal material. And I would, I'd like to talk a little bit about the dopants first, the doping, and I want to make a contrast between deep and shallow dopants. So what, what's that makes semiconductors semiconduct compared to insulators? Like why is silicon different than wood, right? The difference is that if you take a foreign impurity atom and put it in silicon, like a phosphorus ion or a boron ion, it will give you shallow dopants, meaning they will give a state in the band gap that is only a few milli electron volts from the band edges. So at room temperature, those electrons would leave the localized states, go to the band and conduct electricity. That's what we want. In contrast, if you do the same process in an insulator, you will find that sure you introduce the dopants, but the energy you need to pay to activate them is much, much higher, order of EVs. So at room temperature, those dopants do not remain non-ionized, right? So, so that does not give you conduction. Um, and so the dopants being deep means, means that this activation energy is typically much, much wider than KBT. Well, semiconductors, those are shallow and easy to ionize. And how do we find the energy we need to ionize some, um, uh, these dopants? And this takes us back to the introductory quantum mechanics and the Bohr model. So we'll look at the Bohr model and how the energy, the, basically the the dopant acts as a positive charge, the electron acts as a negative charge. So the electron orbits its own ion resembling a hydrogen atom with two minor modifications. 
the mass of the electron needs to be modified to that of the effective mass coming from the band. Band electrons move with a different mass than free electrons. And also take into account that the material screens the Coulomb interaction through its dielectric constant, the dielectric, and comes as the square because of the Bohr model. So in semiconductors, the effective mass is typically a fraction of the free mass, say 0.1 electron masses. The dielectric constant is 10, so 10 squared is 100. So 0.1 over 100 gives you a factor of 1 over 1,000. And that's how you get about 10 millev for the activation energy of topans in semiconductors, right? Order of magnitude 10 millev. But as the gap becomes wider, the effective mass, you see, becomes larger. This is a universal trend in materials that the wider the band gap, the heavier the effective mass. And it's almost a linear trend, as you see here. Um, and also the material becomes a weaker dielectric, it becomes, it's a small dielectric constant. As a result, the activation energy becomes higher and higher as you widen the band gap, and eventually it's hard to ionize a dope until you get an insulator. But not only that, but as the band gap becomes wider, you are more likely to form defect states in the middle of the gap and trap those carriers. For example, a defect would have been in the band typically may appear in the middle of the gap, and the electron will go there and you would lose your electron. <laughs> so so that's, it's, it's, a, it's a double a double challenge. So the open question we'd like to address in our work is how can we improve the efficiency of uh, these ultra wide magnet materials in power electronics and deep UV electronics? But also, I'm coming from physics, I wanted to answer a more fundamental question with my work. We talk about that <coughs> the Semiconductors have narrow gaps and wide gap these are insulators. So how wide can the band gap of the semiconductors be? Where, which, what's the point at which we say, okay, there's no more semiconductors from here on and everything else is an insulator. But also, and once we do that, ask the question, what's the semiconductor that has the widest band gap possible? So I'll try to give you answer to these two questions today. So the methods we, we our, our work is computational. Uh, our goal is to um, to use predictive theory in order to to guide experiment in the discovery of new materials. And the method we use is perhaps some of the most successful theories in the history of science: density function theory. All right. So what's the key? We're trying to solve a very difficult problem. We're trying to solve the interacting many body Schrödinger equation, which is impossible by brute force. And so at some point in time, chemistry and physics took, took two different directions. Chemistry said, we're going to approximate the wave function of the n particles. Well, physicists said, we're going to approximate the Hamiltonian. So I'm going to show you here the physics approach, which is in, you, instead of using the wave function as the key variable, we use the density of electrons. We sum up all electrons and we distill it to, to one density as a function of space. And, and this is the main idea here, because uh, what we do is we map those interacting electrons into a fictitious problem, a problem of independent particles that don't talk to each other, except they move in an effective potential. What I want to emphasize is, okay, that sounds like a plausible approximation, right? What I want to emphasize is, this is not an approximation. This is in principle exact. Okay, the approximation happens because we don't know what this potential is, so we have to make approximate solutions for it. And since your electrons don't interact, the solution is much simpler. Instead of dealing with the n particle wave function, we deal with n independent particle wave functions, much easier to solve, much easier to work with on computers. And for our discovery, uh, Walter Kohn, uh, a great figure in the history of physics, uh, known for many things in physics like the Kohn anomaly, for example, in metals, um, and he got the Nobel Prize in chemistry for, for this discovery. So in the end, the physics method won even in the, in the field of chemistry. I had the pleasure to, uh, Professor Pellars and I had the pleasure to, to meet Walter Kohn, who was in Santa Barbara. Um, uh, unfortunately, he, he, since he has passed away, and uh, I want to say that he, he, in addition to being a great scientist, he was a great person as well. So he, his life biography is a, is a story on its own. So and, and a very well deserved recognition for his work because the density functional theory has yielded some of the most highly cited uh, articles in, in the history of physics and still being used in, in many, many fields besides physics. So how, what's the workflow for calculations? Usually we start with density functional theory to get the equilibrium geometry of our material. 
uh, find the total energy, which is the enthalpy that we use to find the stability of a material, but also study vibrations and get the wave functions. So once we have energy and wave functions, we can do anything in quantum mechanics. So the first thing we do is we have to calculate the band gap. And for the band gap, that's where DFT does not do very well. Uh, what did, DFT typically underestimates the band gaps of insulators by about 50%. And so we come with methods either based on hybrid functionals that mix in part of the of exact exchange or methods based on diagrammatic perturbation theory that's such as the GW method, which give us very accurate band gaps as well as band structures. And once we have band gaps and band structures, we can do things like study optics, study excitons, study transport, and all, all, all the response of the material that we're interested in. Um, all right, and so I'd like to, to show some applications here. What, um, what, can we do, what can you use DFT for in the study of ultra wide background materials? Uh, I was planning to show you some results from my group uh, as well in terms of the uh, characterization of materials, but unfortunately I think maybe it will be too specialized for the audience and perhaps uh, not enough time to cover everything. So instead I'm going to go straight into the discovery of new materials, So uh, I hope it will be more uh, stimulating as, as a topic. So earlier I showed you uh, four ultra wide mega materials, right? Um, gallium oxide, boron nitride, diamond and aluminum nitride. The reason I mentioned these four is not because these are the examples, it's because these are the only four materials. So what can we do to expand the space and find new materials? And I'll show you how we found one. And the reason is we focused on uh, the rutile phase of germanium oxide. Now, I want to start by making a contrast with the quartz phase, right? Uh, if you use silica, silica crystallizes in the quartz phase as well, so they're both stable and they both appear in the phase diagram. So the quartz phase is tetrahedral. It has a low density. And the problem is it dissolves in water. So you can't process it with the usual wet etching techniques. But if you buy the powder, that's what you will get if you purchase the material from a vendor. On the other hand, the rutile is an octahedral material. It's the high density polytype, 50% higher in density. Most critically, it does not dissolve in water. So you can do all these usual etching techniques we use in semiconductors. And it's the most stable bulk material. If you see here the phase diagram at a room temperature, uh, the material stands in the rutile phase. And if you heat it up, there's a small window where the quartz gets stabilized before it melts. So the rutile is the most stable. And that's the one I want to focus on. Uh, because one, one critique which you get is that it dissolves in water. So we're not talking about the water soluble phase. Um, so why germanium oxide is an alternative to gallium oxide? First of all, the reason is gallium and germanium are next to each other in the periodic table. So we expect that it should be similarly good to n type dope. Another name of germanium oxide is tin dioxide. And tin dioxide is a great semiconductor as well, a transparent conducting semiconductor that can be doped. So through the similarities, we're arguing that germanium should be a good candidate. It also has a high symmetry in the crystal structure. So we expect that it will conduct electricity and heat very efficiently. And also it has a higher density of oxygens. And the reason for the oxygen is that the valence band is made by the oxygen orbitals. So if you have a hole in the material, it's not the oxygen atoms. So it is easier for those holes to hop from oxygen to oxygen and give you p-type conduction. And if you look at the literature, this material has never been explored as a semiconductor. The question is, can it be doped? But we started first by the band structure. We have to look at the shape of the bands. And so here's the valence band, here's the conduction band. You see the usual parabolas. You see the band gap here, the, the gamma point of the green zone. Um, but the most important property here is the effective masses. And what we found is that they are not too large. The electrons have a typical effective mass of electrons around 0.2 to 0.4 times the mass of the electron empty space. And the whole masses are around one. So they're actually not too bad. It was actually promising that not only should conduct electrons very efficiently, but also holes. It doesn't give us these flat bands we saw earlier in gallium oxide. But back to the question, is it dopable? So to answer this question, we need to answer the, the, the question of, can we form defects in this material? Can we include dopants? And just a, this is the only equation I will show you in this, in this talk, because this equation tells you how to calculate the formation energy of a defect. 
All right. So how much energy do I need to pay to create a defect in the material? That's a question we try to answer. So the way we calculate this, we make a simulation cell where, for the case of a vacancy, we remove one of the atoms and we make a comparison between the defective cell and the pristine cell. And we look at the energy difference. But we're not done yet because we have to answer the question, OK, we removed an atom. What did we do with this atom? Did we put in a low energy state or a high energy state? So we need a reference state. Now, what did we do with this atom? And the reference state can be either the metal, the bulk metal phase, if you're talking about the metal atom, it can be in the oxygen gas phase, if you talk about the oxygen, or any, any other phase in the phase diagram, honestly. The defects can also be charged. They, can, they may have an extra electron trapped into them, or they may be positive in each other, they have lost an electron. So we need to say also what happened to any electrons we added or removed. And those are being exchanged with the Fermi energy, right? So electrons from the Fermi level may move to your defect or vice versa. The defect may lose electrons to the Fermi level and become positively charged. And so that, 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 that's why you see these terms in the equation. And so charged defects depends on the Fermi level. And when you put this all together, you get plots like this, okay? So your formation energy on the y-axis depends on the Fermi level, okay? So the neutral defect doesn't depend on the Fermi level. That's why you see this constant value here. A positive charge defect increases with Fermi level and the negative decreases. So for any given Fermi level, we're trying to find what is the most stable state of the defect. If your Fermi level is close to the valence band, that means that your defect would rather give the electrons to the Fermi level, it's low, and reduce its energy. As you increase the Fermi level, though, eventually the, you, the defect will be neutral. And if you increase it and close the conduction band, then electrons would leave the Fermi level and go to your defect and charge it negatively. Okay, so that's what you will see here. So we have these transition points where the defect changes charge state, the thermodynamic transition energy that changes the charge state. And that corresponds to the energy we need to pay to ionize the defects. Okay. So that's one thing we'll see here. The other thing we will see is that if we change the growth conditions, if we change the chemical potentials of the species that we use to exchange atoms with, we can change the formation energy, right? For example, oxygen defects are more likely to form if you grow under vacuum than under oxygen. And the same with the metal. Uh, if you grow under oxygen-rich conditions, you are less likely to form a metal vacancy uh, I'm more likely to form a metal vacancy because it's metal poor conditions than if you were to grow under metal rich conditions. If you have excess metal, you're going to fill those empty spots more easily. Okay, and the range of chemical potentials is given by the formation energy of the compounds uh, of all possible compounds in the phase diagram that we're, we're working with. So you see here how the environment determines the formation of those, of those defects as well. So we have some control on forming those defects. So with that, I want to summarize because you will see lots of these plots in the remaining of the talk, and I want to make sure that everybody's following what this diagram means. So the first thing we'll look at is donors in germanium oxide. So here again, you see the formation energy of various kinds of defects as a function of the Fermi level between the top of the valence band and the bottom of the conduction band under germanium-rich or oxygen-rich conditions. And we find that if you grow under oxygen poor conditions, it's easy to remove oxygen atoms and replace them with a fluorine. And this fluorine atom will always be positive no matter what the Fermi level, meaning it is a donor. It gave itself into the conduction band. It, um, however, we need to make, be careful not to have nitrogen because it competes with uh, fluorine and would steal its electrons. So you don't want to have nitrogen in the growth environment. On the other hand, if you grow under air, let's say under oxygen rich conditions, uh, antimony is a, a more candidate donor, but you're also likely to form germanium vacancies and compensate. So probably not the best uh, conditions to, to achieve n-type docking. So we, we suggest that oxygen poor conditions are under, growing under vacuum is more likely to give doping. We we'll also look at acceptors. And now you see easier the ionization energy. If you look at the energy difference between this knee here and the valence band, that's the energy you need to pay to ionize the holes. I mean, these, these act as acceptors. Um, so the acceptors are not too deep. The problem is they are compensated. As you go to, towards P-type conditions with your Fermi level closer to the top of the valence band, 
your aluminum atoms, let's say, won't replace germanium, instead it will become interstitials. You're also going to form oxygen vacancies and all of these defects steal the, the holes and so you won't get p-type conduction. However, we found that if you co-dope these defects with hydrogen, what happens is that this interstitial hydrogen will passivate them and create a neutral defect complex. As a result, you can incorporate high concentrations of aluminum or gallium or indium into the, the lattice, those acceptors, and then you can remove the hydrogen by rapid thermal annealing and, and get the p-type conduction. So this is a non-equilibrium doping technique. And by the way, this is how, they, how it works for p-type doping of P -type, uh, of gallium nitride with magnesium. That's the work that gave the Nobel Prize to the inventors of the blue LED. So it is possible to p-type dope under non-equilibrium conditions. Next, we look at the mobilities. We have the formalism that calculates the, the phonon limit mobilities due to interactions of electrons and holes with phonons. And what we find is that the mobilities are quite sizable, uh, around 240 for the electrons and 370 for the holes. So again, you see that they exceed those of, of gallium oxide and, 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 they're, and they're very uh, sizable for, for n-type conduction. We also find though that even hole conduction is efficient because the hole mobility is also quite, quite high for, 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 for holes. And so if we put this all together and say, how do we quantify the performance in power electronics? Here's the figure of merit. So you need to combine the breakdown field, the mobility and the electric constant in order to find this quantity, the body figure of merit. And by comparing to other materials, you see that the rutan germanium oxide outperforms most of the current technologies for power electronics, uh, both for N-type as well as for, for P-type. So it is a very promising material. Um, still challenges because, as I mentioned earlier, this material has never been mentioned as a semiconductor before, so nobody has seen conductivity, and so we need experiments to, to grow it. And so we started doing experiments as well, and all the things we, we looked at is uh, trying to grow them in, in bulk form, starting from the quartz powder. So by pressing, hot pressing quartz powder, we converted the material to a pellet and measured its thermal properties, and we found that indeed it surpasses that of gallium oxide. So indeed, uh, germanium oxide it seems to be also a better thermal conductor than gallium oxide. And so it is a promising alternative to, to consider for, for electronic applications. And last but not least, I want to share some work we did with our experimentalist colleagues where we grew the first crystal in epitaxial thin films of this material uh, on top of uh, a, thin, uh, a thin dark side coated on sapphire. And because of the orientation between the rutile geometry and the sapphire geometry, we were able to grow these thin films uh, with high quality. It's the first report of uh, single crystalline thin films of germanium oxide, which usually grows amorphous uh, in, in, in epitaxy. And if you listen to learn about this work too, we recently wrote a perspective article that covers our work in, in this space of how to dope the ultra wide band of semiconductors. And if we have a few minutes, I'd like to, to share another topic on the, um, in general, uh, what are the upper limits to dopability? So what are the properties that make germanium oxide or any other semiconductor a good semiconductor? So one is we want the gap to be wide to get a high breakdown field. We also want the conduction band to made of the large gallium or germanium S orbitals because that gives us a broad bandwidth and a light effective mass. For the holes, we want holes to more easily hop between oxygen atoms. So we need the oxygen atoms to overlap a lot. And that gives us a light hole effective mass. And last but not least, we want high symmetry in order to get reduced band folding and, and high, uh, high mobility, reduced scattering. So can we find these features in other materials? So that's what we did. We look at a series of binary materials and try to find how their band gap and effective masses correlates with the structural properties. So first thing, we look at the chemistry effects. And we found that you need light elements to get the white band gap because of the electronegativity. And the oxides tend to give you wider band gaps than either nitrides or carbides. We also find that the more densely we pack the ions, the um, 
uh, the, the smaller the radius and the denser the packing, the easier it is to get those wider band gaps. So, so we need those lighter elements uh, to get the ultra wide band gaps. And, and that's, that's why you see lots of boron and carbon and oxygen here. Next, look at the effective masses. And we see two opposite trends. That when we look at cations, it is that the larger the cation gives you to less dense packing, uh, the effective mass tends to go up. And the reason is that uh, those ions, uh, the ions that are less dense, tend to be larger and give you light effective masses. But holes show an opposite trend. For holes, the denser the atoms, the lighter the effective mass. And if you see here, cubic boron nitride and including diamond are some of the lowest hole effective mass materials that are out there because they're some of the most densely packed. Uh, then we look at the, how the effective mass changes with the band gap. And in both cases, we see that both the electron mass and the hole mass tends to increase as the band gap gets wider. Okay, so there's this universal trend that there's a, a universal line that is hard to, to go below. Um, but at any given value, we see that the, at any given band gap value, we see that the materials with the lowest mass are the most dense ones atomically dense, more, more highest number of atoms per unit volume. And so then using the Bohr model, we try to predict what would be the energy needed to ionize those dopants. And so here's our analysis. We found many materials that pre we predict to have the shallowest dopants given the band gap value. And we recover many known materials. We found zinc oxide. In this list, we find tin dioxide, gallium oxide that we uh, talked about earlier, germanium oxide is here as well. For the p types, we also found diamond and cubic boron nitride. But we also were able to find some new ones that have been mentioned in the literature. We found n type magnesium oxide, and we found rutile silica, as well as many beryllium oxide polytypes, with most notable the rock sulfate. And so, and the same we also found for the rutile materials for the holes, in addition to the rocks or zinc oxide. Now, I want to emphasize, this is based on a model, not on calculations. So our next thing is to, to go with the domestic calculations and validate these predictions. And, and that's what we did. So I apologize again for the messy plots. What you need to focus on is the lightest, uh, the lowest energy defects. So for rocks and magnesium oxide, we indeed found that it has both shallow donors, such as fluorine on the oxygen side, as well as shallow acceptors. And in fact, there are reports in the literature that magnesium oxide can be doped P-type. But that is compensation, right? So when you go towards N-type conditions, you can form magnesium vacancy that will passivate the dopants. But when you go to yeah, for p-type doping, you don't have oxygen vacancies. But as I mentioned, p-type doping has been reported. So you see, even though there's compensation, you still get uh, holes to conduct. And rutile silica is a case where our prediction failed because when we did automatic calculations, we found that the dopants are not deep, are not shallow deep. You see that you have two EV activation here, two EV activation there. It's 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 the, those won't be ionized. So I won't talk about rutile silica much more. Um, for wood side beryllium oxide, the stable phase, we also find that the predictions were not true. And the reason is those acceptors we tried form DX centers in that the neutral state breaks the bond and buckles and, and removes and, and, and you lose your carrier. So I can ask a more question about this later if you have questions. Because I, uh, I but for, for zinc, the residual phase, we did found shallow dopants with an activation energy of around one electron volt. We did not find the formation of a DX center. And so, and the band gap here is nine and a half EV. So a material with a nine and a half EV band gap has uh, shallow donors. But I also want to show you the last material we, we found, which is the rock phase of beryllium oxide. Now this is a high pressure polytype and the band gap is 11.6 EV. Now that's widest that, that the widest gap insulators. Yet what we found, it has no donors, all donors are very deep, but there are acceptors which are shallow, such as lithium replacing the beryllium side. They are compensated, but they're shallow. So that, that, that's a unique effect, a, un, a unique thing as far as I know that a material with such a wide band gap having shallow dopants. And the reason for this is we understand it. 
the reason for that is the dense packing of the oxygen atoms in, in the rock beryllium oxide makes the valence band be more shallow. So defects that are typically deep in other polytypes become shallow because they hybridize with the valence band. So it's because of that precise dense packing of the oxygens that we get the, um, the p-type conduction. And here's the summary. So this prediction that there are shallow acceptors in a material with a gap that is wider than 11 electron volts, that's wider than most insulators, proves to us that there is no fundamental upper limit to what the band gap of semiconductors can be. The materials with gaps as wide as level they can hold shallow dopants, so there is really no gap that separates semiconductors from insulators. So it's a bold claim, but we have an example to show where, where it works. It still needs to be worked experimentally, but theory makes this, this prediction, and, and we have reason to, to, to show that this, this should be true. All right, before I, summar, before I conclude, I'd like to advertise also, I'm also the chair of the PhD and materials program at the University of Michigan, and we're top program in material science engineering, and we're leaders in all areas, uh, and we place a strong emphasis on collaboration, on well-being, on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So if you are still who's interested in graduate studies in materials, uh, I'll be very happy to talk to you and talk to you about our program. And of course, we, we welcome your application in, in this false admission cycle. All right, and with that, I'd like to acknowledge the people who did their work, the students in my group, as well as the funding sources, and I'll leave you with that. Again, thank you for the invitation and thank you for attending today and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much for the very nice talk. So we have indeed time for some questions. So I, I have one about the rock salt beryllium oxide. You mentioned it mentioned mentioned its uh, high pressure phase. So yes, what what kind of pressures are we actually talking? That's about? That's a great question. I, I need, uh, so I, I was looking at the inorganic crystallographic database, and there's only one mention in the literature from from quite a while ago as well. And so there's only one report of its synthesis, but I, I don't recall the pressure at this moment. But that's a great question to, for us to look at. Um, yeah, uh, the formation energy is around 0.4 EV above the stable phase, the wood side phase. So it's still uh, a little bit unstable, but I, I, I hope it's metastable so it can be uh, synthesized at high pressure and then um, uh, and remain metastable even if the pressure is removed. Judy? So um, it's very interesting talk. So could you say um, again about the mechanism with the hydrogen assist the co-doping yes, in yes. germanium oxide? Yes, it, it, that's a great question. Yeah, so non this is a technique for non-equilibrium doping. And that's a technique that it has been used in the case of uh, the nitrite. So the idea is that uh, acceptors are negatively charged. Interstitial hydrogen is positively charged. So if you insert them at the same time, you form this charge neutral complex of the hydrogen with aluminum. Uh, the, the problem, for example, suppose you start with a neutral material, an undoped, and you introduce the first acceptors. As you, the, the first aluminum will come and replace germanium and will happily become an acceptor. But as you put more and more acceptors, the Fermi level starts to shift towards the valence band. And then the acceptors become neutral or you start to form oxygen vacancies. So in the end, you have an equilibration where the Fermi level will be pinned somewhere here. Mm -hmm. Now, why the hydrogen trick? By making this complex with hydrogen, the defects become neutral. So as you incorporate them to the lattice, they don't change the Fermi level. They also have a very low formation energy. You see there are about 0.3 electron volts. So you, you can incorporate very high concentrations of aluminum without affecting the Fermi level. And that is seen also in, in gallium nitride. And then once the aluminum is inside the material, then you do rapid thermal annealing. So the aluminum is too slow to diffuse, but the halogen will diffuse out and you will be left with the activated acceptors. And that's what people do in gallium nitride to incorporate magnesium without forming compensating nitrogen vacancies. 
who, and, and that, that's, that's what gave uh, Suji Nakamura the, the Nobel Prize for making the first P-type gallium nitride, and then he made the first blue LED and the first blue laser. So what if there's some hydrogen remain in the material, say so not completely diffuse out, would that, how would that, would that affect the property of the material? Okay, that's a, a great question as well, yeah. So it would, uh, though it will definitely compensate some of the acceptors. In fact, that, that is a challenge in many of these materials, that halogen is always present in the environment, right? From water, from, so once you expose your material to air, so halogen would probably come in the material. So if you can't diffuse all of it out, it will neutralize some acceptors. And so you, mm -hmm. you only get those holes in the valence band. But um, yeah, if you get most of it out then, or, or a fraction of it out, then you should be able to get those acceptors activated. And, 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 and the, the groups who are expert in this technique are in North Carolina State University uh, and who work a lot with a uh, group three nitrides and they also shown it for, uh, for um, a group of they, they also do these techniques also, uh, they try to do also incorporation of acceptors under light, under radiation. So that's another trick to get non-equilibrium Fermi levels during the growth. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. We have another question from Reese. Uh, sorry, can I have a question? Yes, yeah, of course, please. Yeah, uh, you show a nice figure summarizing the DFT would consistently underestimate the band gap yes, of yes. materials. Uh, as someone not in this field, uh, do we have enough data because you know a lot of uh, band gap of material of many materials and also the DFT results? Is there any way to uh, add a universal factor or something to, so that when you have a new calculation, we know, okay, we need to add 0. 0.7 or something. I'm just a naive idea. Yeah. It, it's actually, it's, you're raising a great question because there are people right now trying to use machine learning to account for exactly this correction. Yes, so you are absolutely right. How can we use maybe the chemistry of the material in combination with the gap to, 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 to correct it? Uh, it is, yeah, so if you see the typical factor is about 50% for semiconductors, but there are some notable exceptions. I will point here to germanium. As you see, LDA using the simplest functionals predicts that germanium is a metal. So we have some really bad results that we need to correct, right? But thankfully today we have tools to correct for them. So uh, I really want to uh, um, emphasize again that uh, if you do DFT either with hybrid functionals uh, like Hartwin and I use or with the GW method, you'll be able to correct for, for this band gap underestimation. And then you are in much better agreement with the experiment, typically a 0.1 EV or so, which is also the experimental accuracy uh, depending on the technique that people use. Uh, but, but you're right about, yeah, the, the, there are some uh, rules, some heuristic rules being developed to, to, to make this correction um, in a high throughput fashion for you universally for all materials. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions? So before everyone leaves, so after this, this question session, there is a session for only the graduate students to either ask more questions to the speaker or to just have general discussions. So please stick around for that as well. I think there are no more questions. So let's thank the speaker again. And thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thanks for coming today.